Okay, we're going to look at Psalms chapter 63 today. We're talking about knowing the Father better, and uh, we are, they are recording us again, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, knowing the Father better, I uh, start off every week with the same verse, 1 Chronicles 28, 9, if you seek Him, He will be found by you. Uh, when we get to know someone better, it always takes time, it takes personal interaction, uh, but there's always room to know someone better. There's always room to know someone better. Uh, if you think about the people in your lives, even family members, uh, a few years ago I started doing the math that I had lived with Lisa, my wife, longer than I'd ever lived at home, that I had lived with my brother, and yet after all those years, I know my brother fairly well, but there's a lot of time has elapsed since the time I left the house, and he was 14 years old. Uh, so there's always room to know him better, but I, when we talk about the Father, it's the same way. We, it's, it's more of a pursuit. We're pursuing God. We're, we're trying to get to know him better. And so today, we're going to continue what we started last week. Last week, we looked at Psalm 62. Knowing God, knowing God better through others' experiences, through others' experiences. Because when we talk with other people, other people have different, they have different perspectives, different experiences, uh, different things that they've gone through. And that is something that we can all learn from. Uh, because, because I was raised in a certain way, I have certain experiences, my mind seems to be stuck in that direction. But when I talk with others, it, I'm pulled out of that. And I'm able to sort of broaden what I think or what I see. And when we talk about knowing God better, I, that is the direction we're going to go today. Because we're looking at a psalm from David. And David had a lot of experiences, a lot of experiences that are different from ours. This week, uh, last Thursday, Thursday nights, I don't do it every week, but I try to often. I'm, since we homeschool, I do a Bible class for the kids. And so what I've been doing is pulling out the verses we're going to do for this class, and then we're going to read it together, and I throw it out for my kids, throw questions out for them, and let's see if they'll answer any of them. And uh, they do some, especially when I force them. <laughs> that, well, that's, that's what it comes down to sometimes. <laughs> but... Uh, as we read it together this week, I, there were some really, really interesting parts of it uh, that I hope that we can bring out good today, and I hope we can have discussion on too. So let's look at Psalm chapter 63, and I just want to read the whole chapter. It's not that long. It says, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my, upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth, they shall be given over to the power of the sword, and they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Knowing the Father better, David, we know he had time to think about the Father. We know he had time with his relationship with the Father. He started off as a shepherd out in the field, uh, and I'm sure there weren't too many distractions uh, sitting there watching sheep most of the day, uh, doing this or that. Every once in a while, you have... Uh, uh, something trying to get the sheep. You have others that show up and you have to watch the sheep a little better. Uh, I just know, uh, I guess the best analogy I have is with children. I remember going to the playground when my children were small and if the playground was crowded, 
it was difficult because I had my antennas up and I was looking every direction. I, I have to keep my eyes on them. I have to know what's going on. But if no one's out there, I didn't pay attention. I just let them do what they wanted to uh, and, and thought about other things. But David, he's got different experiences than we do. And I want to start with verse 1. It says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Knowing God requires a hunger, it requires a thirst. Now, I don't know if this happens to you very often, so during the summer, a lot of times I'm working outside, and any time in the summer you work outside, I don't drink enough. Uh, in fact, that is the, the goal every time we have a job somewhere, is can we drink enough? Can we drink enough? Never, never, never are successful. So I understand what David's saying here about being thirsty, being thirsty. Do we have that hunger or thirst required to seek the Lord, required to know him better, to know him better? Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus even has that idea that we need to be hungry for God, hungry to do what's right, what God has for us. Uh, Psalm chapter 42 says, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I, shall I come and appear before God? When we are interested in something or want to know something, some, uh, sometimes our, our appetite for it can be voracious, can it? Uh, I get stuck often with a chore at home, and I try to figure out how to solve this. How am I going to do this? And I, I tear up YouTube looking for how to do it, how to do it this way. I go look for pictures trying to do this. And it doesn't seem that when I ran into a dead end, I'm not deterred. I just go a different direction and we keep going. Uh, it's the same with my work. My work, I have to do a lot of research from time to time and we'll run across a product that is old and there's just nothing on the internet at all about it. And so you start going every which direction you can think of to find something, looking for knowledge. And this is just to a lesser degree than what we're talking about here about knowledge of God, about understanding him, hunger and thirsting for him. Uh, Psalm chapter 143 verses five and six says, I remember the days of old I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hand. I stretch out my hand to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. So when we talk about hungering and thirsting for God, is there something in your life that has helped you develop this better? Something that has helped you develop this better? Because I think it's as with all, everything when we talk about a relationship with God, it's something we have to grow in something we have to develop, something we have to uh, work at if we're going to go to any level whatsoever. So is there something in any of your lives that has helped you develop that hunger for God? Problems. Problems. Please explain. <laughs> Okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. That's definitely true. Uh, we seem to be at peace until we have a problem, and then we, we be, have a faith crisis many times. Uh, many times. All right. Someone else. What's something else that's help, helped you develop a hunger for God? Aha, uh -huh, you guys didn't think I was going to ask a question in the first 10 minutes, did you? <laughs> when I come on a question that I really want an answer for, okay. it's one of those that eats at me. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Yes. I don't know how many studies I have that are topical, that are halfway done, that I write notes on, because for that very reason, something comes up, somebody says something, and I get to thinking about it. Uh, some of the best studies I did when I was overseas, I would study with people, and they would ask me questions I'd never thought of in my life about God. And then I would spend a week trying to figure out just some answer, not, just e not even a good answer, but I need some answer that I can actually have a basis to speak with them on. And that would cause me to really dig and really go. So that's a, that's a good example. That's a good example. Anyone else? Sometimes just okay. meeting someone who seems to be really connected with God and the peace that they have will make you desire that. Very good, yeah. And that's... A lot of times it's unexpected, isn't it? When you meet someone and they're very, they have such a great perspective on God, it makes you want to up your game and do a little better. Yeah, very good. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Well, thank you. These are very good. So knowing the Father better requires a hunger or a desire. Let's go back to chapter 63, verse 2. It says, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Beholding your power and glory. If we look, the Father's power and glory is visible. We've talked about this in the past. But something I wanted to bring out is that David had his eyes open. He was looking at the Father and he was looking for the Father. Uh, there's a phrase that was used in my house a lot. Usually when my mom went to, had me go look for something. And the phrase is, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. If it was a snake, it would have bit you. Meaning that it is obvious. It is right there. It is so close to you that as a snake, it could have bit you. But yet you didn't see it, did you? And how many times, oh, I know this happens for people who wear glasses too. You look around for your glasses, you go all over the house, you figure out they're on your head or they're, you're, they're in your shirt, or something like that. David, he was looking for the Father, and he saw his power and his glory in his life. Uh, we spend too much time not looking for the Father, but to know him better, we need to look for him, because he's visible. His power and glory can be seen in our community here, in our families, in our surroundings, in nature, in our time of worship each week, which is one reason I, our times together become more and more valuable to me because that's the time when you can see God's power and glory in our brothers and sisters, in the words that we say, in the words that we hear from God's word. So to know him better, we need to see him, his presence, his character, his footprints so that we know that he's here. He is with us and that he is, he will deliver us. Uh, there's a phrase that I have prayed in the past. I prayed it often. And the phrase is, please help me to see you more clearly. To see you more clearly. Now, the, the reason I pray this is because I'm convinced that my life will be transformed a little bit more if I see God a little bit better. Uh, let's go over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. There's an example of this. Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 9. Don't worry, we're not going to go with a lot of symbols here. Too many, I should say. But uh, there's a description here. Uh, God comes to John. He's, he shows him a vision. He's about to give him some words that he needs to write down. And it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, your brother and partner in, in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and from, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and beho behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. So John, I've often wondered, he's in this vision, he sees Jesus. He sees God. I wonder how his life was transformed from this point on. John was someone who had actually walked with Jesus as well. But I believe that every time we see the Lord, Every time we understand him a little bit better, our lives are transformed a little bit more. Which is the reason I picked out this topic and we keep going through this, the same idea about knowing the Father better, knowing the Father better. So let's go back to uh, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Verse 3. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Last week we talked about this in chapter 62, talked about God's steadfast love. Steadfast meaning firmly loyal or constant, unswerving, steady, unwavering course in love. So God's steadfast love, he says, is better, is more valuable than life. How do we know if something is good or valuable? Just in general. How do we know if something is good or valuable? You Google it. You Google it. All right, that is one way. That is one way. The blue book, okay. <laughs> Kelly's blue book does help you quite a bit, doesn't it? And I've looked at it a lot to see how unvaluable my car is. Uh, so we, we look at references, don't we? Sometimes we talk to others, don't we? Uh, I've talked to people about different subjects to, to say, see if something is good or not. Would you do this? Is that good? Uh, the guys at my work, since they're all engineers, if you really need to know if a product is good, you go talk to one of them because they have all researched things to the, to the nine before they buy something. And so I don't have to research, I just go ask them to find out what's good and what's not. And they'll tell me. Um, but here, David says that there is something that is good, something that is more valuable than life. He says it's God's steadfast love. And you know, I've read this a lot, but I never thought of it this way. The phrase is very familiar. We all know the phrase. We've heard, the fr heard, heard this voice. But you know... Life for us is valuable. That's why we spend so much on health care, vitamins, maybe even fitness training or other stuff like that. For us, life is valuable. But David says there's something even better than this life. God's steadfast love is even better. Uh, it's hard to wrap, wrap my head around. It's something that changes my priorities and perspective, at least it should. What if we clung to God's love as hard as we try to cling to this life? I think we would know the Father a little bit better, and I think that we would live a little bit different, and we'd be a different church, wouldn't we? Uh, Psalm chapter 136. Psalm 136. You know, when I look through verses, I try not to get sections that are really, really long, but this one, there's no way to cut it off the way it's written. 
So we're going to read the whole thing, Psalm 136. Um, and I hope you catch the phrase that is repeated once or twice in this psalm, okay? It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who, underst who, who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made, great, made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. To the sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. <coughs> Excuse me. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand, in an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people, <coughs> excuse me led his people <coughs> through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, the king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. And that love is better than life, David said. Just like last week, to know the Father better, we need to understand a little bit better about his steadfast love how he loves us, and how valuable that is in our lives. <coughs> Psalm chapter 63. 63, verses 4 and 5, it says, So I will bless you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Yahweh deserves to be blessed and praised. Deserves to be blessed and praised. So, here's the easy question. Why? Why does God deserve to be blessed and praised? Because he's God. Very good. Yeah. Come on out. Unchanging. Very good, yes. Because he's low. Very good. Okay, because he said so. Yeah. And we have seen that we can trust him. Trust his word, right? We can trust what he says. Anyone else? It says, the Lord satisfies the soul. <coughs> he, 
He fills the hole that he created in our hearts that only he fits in. You know, we try with a lot of different things, people try with a lot of different things to fill the hole in their heart that only God fits in. Um, it reminds me, it, they try, but it doesn't matter. There's only one thing that fills that hole and it makes it good. It reminded me of another hole that we had. I'm sure you all had even driven through it. Behind CC's Pizza in the Walmart parking lot for years, there was this hole. I would hit it sometimes. I would go around it sometimes. It just depended. And so they tried to fill this hole. And then a few weeks later, it's just as bad. In fact, one Christmas, somebody even got the smart idea that they put a plant in there to fill the hole. I don't know how long the plant stayed in there, but I'm sure it, <laughs> I'm sure it didn't... Uh, it didn't sit well with the people who ran the parking lot, and they finally fixed the hole. But they tried with all sorts of things to fill that hole, and it just didn't work because they didn't do it right. David says here that the Lord satisfies our soul. Only the Lord, and that's why he should be praised, and that's why he should be blessed, because he fills that hole. In Luke chapter 19, uh, the context is Jesus was, he had entered Jerusalem. It was a triumphal entry as to what we have phrased it in our Bibles. Uh, people were cheering, people were worshiping, people were uh, glad he was there. And after it happens, the Pharisees tell Jesus, you need to rebuke your disciples. And his answer is, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out, the Lord deserves praise and blessing. For who he is, for what he has done, what he continues to do, it all has one result, that we should bless and praise him. He deserves to have our hearts engaged and centered on the one who is everything. Who is everything. Verse 6 says that uh, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you and meditate on you in the watches of the night for you have been my help. We'll get to seven. Verse six. Knowing the Father requires us to concentrate on him. Uh, to remember and meditate. How many of you throughout the week think about <coughs> someone that you knew in the past? Maybe a family member, someone, maybe someone who's passed on, maybe someone who just lives in another location. We all do that, at least I do, fairly often. Uh, There's certain people that have passed away that I think about all the time. I remember them. I think about them. And when I concentrate on them, at least these people are people that have encouraged and made a difference in my life, and it, uh, it lifts me up. David says here that if we want to know the Father better, we need to concentrate on him. David spent time thinking about, spent time remembering what God had done. And we have, thankfully, we have quite a bit of David's life where we see what God had done. And I'm sure that stayed with him. And he remembered those things, how God had, had delivered him, how God had helped him. Well, what happens when we remember or meditate on things? Focus, okay. All right. All right. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Reinforce it in our lives. Reinforce in our lives. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. then he's way too big 
or from other things just getting here. Uh, I like that. That's very good. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, yes, yes. I like that. I like that. He's too big for other things to fit in there, too. Yeah. Definitely true. Definitely true. You know, when we remember and meditate on things, the same things you all had said, things are brought to the front of our minds, concentrate on them, uh, and they're impressed a little deeper on our hearts, aren't they, than they were before. Uh, my wife has been doing clay, and she's she has taken over part of my shop and she does clay in it and I go out there just to see if she's still alive from time to time and uh, she has all these these things that she's using to press into the clay and she'll press something and then she has this bin of stuff that's broken or she doesn't want to use anymore so and then she's gonna I, I'm assuming she's recycling it, gonna redo it again but uh, but I'll ask her, and she said, well, that didn't turn out too good. I was like, why not? Well, I didn't, it wasn't pressed in enough. So when we remember and meditate, this is the same thing for us. It helps us press in a little bit harder, a little bit harder. Uh, who God is helps us know him better. Uh, verse 7, it's for you have been my help, and, the and in the shadow of your wing I will sing for joy. talked about this, uh, David had mentioned this in chapter 62 as well, God is our help, God is our protection. You know, we need help, we just refuse to ask for it so many times. Uh, I have a couple of children that uh, they would rather get a, I think they'd rather get a zero on an assignment than to ask for help if they don't understand it. And I, well, we've had a conversation over and over, if you need help, ask for help. If you need help, you ask for help. And then, although I've said that I don't know how many times, I fall in that same category because when I need help, I don't ask for help, do I? We all, we all have struggle with that from time to time. We do the same thing as adults. We do the same thing spiritually. So the question is, why don't we ask for help? There's a lot of different reasons, but I'll throw that question out there. Why don't we ask for help? Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Okay, someone else over here? <laughs> That's what it comes down to a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Right, right. And then if Google pops up something that you don't like, you just have it. Google doesn't know what it's doing today. <laughs> <laughs> but we do we have we have a tough time asking for help David said that God is our help God is our help uh, I've got a few verses here Psalm, uh, they're all in Psalms Psalms 18 6 it says in my distress I called upon the Lord to my God I cried for help from his temple he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears very much like that one. Because God hears our cry for help. God hears our cry for help. Psalm chapter 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. It's almost identical to what we read in verse 7 of chapter 63. Uh, Psalm 3320, our soul waits for the, excuse me, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 109, 26, in light of the point we had before, I couldn't leave this one out. It says, help me, O Lord my God, save me according to your steadfast love. According to your steadfast love. God is our help and our protection. It's something we cannot forget. Uh, last point real quick. Chapter, uh, verse 8. It says, My soul clings to you. My right hand upholds me. He says, My right hand upholds me. To me, a thought comes to mind is care and protection. Uh, so out of all of my children, I only had one that was a baby that we had. And I remember when they handed him to us, he was four weeks old, and I literally thought, 
uh, this isn't going to go well. He's going to be, I'm going to break him. You know, he just small. He fit in the length of my arm there. Of course, he is the tallest one now. It was Sean. But uh, that's what I think of when I think of this verse, is that God holds us. He upholds us with his hand. He cares for us. He protects us. The same hands that formed the world. He says in John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him there was nothing made that was made. The same hands that sealed the ark. It says in Genesis chapter 7, after Noah and the animals and his family went in, it says God shut the ark. Uh, the same hands that touched the leper. The leper comes to Jesus for healing and Jesus not only heals them, but he does something even better. He touches them. The same hands that pulled Peter from the storm when he had had the courage and faith to step out of the boat and then started doubting and started to sink. The same hands that took the nails for us and for our sin. Those are the same hands that reach for you and me. Those are the same hands that want to hold us in the end, after this life. God's right hand upholds us. God's right hand upholds us. Um, so we will stop there this week. Next week we will continue on about knowing God better. I don't know how this quarter is going to go. I started counting out the Sundays and it puts us at, I think, almost 15 weeks We'll see if that's what everybody else calculated too. But uh, we'll keep going this, uh, this quarter. Uh, next quarter, I'm not sure yet who the rotation will be. So you get Rick talking about heaven. And you have Donnie talking about dwelling. I believe that's the topic he's still talking about. And uh, he's been doing that for a while, so I don't know if it's going to be switched at some point or not. But... Uh, but thank you all for your thoughts and your comments today, and we'll see you next week.